Hi, and welcome to the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. Hi, and welcome to the story of cooking. I'm Sarah Nicholas. This show explores people and their unique story of cooking. It'll be a historical journey as well as a culinary experience. Each week we're going to take a different group of people and explore their story of cooking and how you can do that in your own home. Even if you're not a four-star chef, you can have a love for cooking and an interest in history and create these dishes in your own home. So the first dish we're going to make is a rhubarb pie. The second one is a fried chicken, and lastly, a sweet corn pudding. These three dishes come from one of my personal favorite traditions of a Shenandoah Valley potluck. So we're gonna go right into it. We're gonna start with Mrs. Rao's rhubarb pie. The first important part of a pie is obviously its crust. Um, so I will start with that. Um, the first thing that you're gonna need is flour, two cups of flour, and a teaspoon of salt. We're gonna sift that together just to make sure it doesn't have any clumps or anything like that. It makes the dough much better. So Mrs. Rowell is a legend in pie making in the Shenandoah Valley, um, specifically uh, Stanton, Virginia. That is actually where I am from and I grew up eating at Mrs. Rowell's and my parents are actually really good friends with the owners, uh, Mike and Mary Lou DeGrasse, who are the um, son and daughter-in-law of Mrs. Rowell. Um, she's known internationally and nationally around the world as the pie lady. So you know that her pies are gonna be good. So our flour is looking good. We have this sifted. We're just gonna go ahead and add the rest. Okay, so we have our flour. The next ingredient is gonna be shortening. Um, this is vegetable shortening and it's important to have cold vegetable shortening. You're gonna cut it into the flour. This is her famous recipe. She actually um, died many years ago, um, but people, she's still so famous around um, the city of Stanton that people still request her rhubarb pie. And because it was Mrs. Rowell's favorite, actually when she deceased, they decided not to carry rhubarb pie anymore. So my grandmother wanted rhubarb pie for her 80th birthday. So her son, Mike, went to her, his mother, Mrs. Rowell's backyard in Stanton, Virginia, where she always had rhubarb growing which is unusual for the city of Stanton. It usually grows freely in the Appalachian Mountains, but she had it in her backyard. He went there, got the rhubarb, and made her a rhubarb pie for her 80th birthday. And that was the best present ever for her. All right, so we're cutting the shortening into the dough. Um, the important thing is the texture of the dough. You don't want to overwork it, um, but you want it to be kind of sand-like. So I'm just going to use my hands because it's easier. This is called the sable method in France. Sable meaning sand-like. Then you're gonna add your wet ingredients. It's very messy, it's okay. Um, one egg, beaten. And then we have vinegar, which it seems like kind of an odd ingredient. It doesn't add any taste, but it helps to stabilize the dough. So we're gonna add vinegar, two tablespoons of vinegar. Mix all that together. All right, so you kind of need it. You don't want to need it too much, um, but make a ball. And if it needs more water, um, we have some water to add to it, but this actually doesn't look too bad. We'll add a little bit. Um, sometimes it takes six tablespoons. Sometimes it takes no tablespoons. We're gonna add one tablespoon, see how it looks. It kind of just depends on the temperature of the room. And uh, just, just use your eyeballs. Use how it looks, how it feels. If it's forming a ball like this is, obviously this is, this is good. We don't need to add any more moisture to this. So we're gonna put the dough in the fridge for about an hour till it's nice and cold so it'll be easier to roll out um, when we're ready to assemble our pie. So now we're gonna start with our filling. The first thing that goes in are two eggs, sugar, 
sweeten up the rhubarb. Rhubarb tends to be a little tart, so the sugar will help. Uh, we have AP flour and the rhubarb, two cups of rhubarb that are thinly sliced, just the stems. So you're just gonna mix all of that together and that becomes your filling. Very simple, but very delicious. Next, we're gonna roll the dough. So I'm gonna clear my workspace here. Get the nice cold dough that's been in the refrigerator for about an hour. Potlucks, or the, the first version of potlucks, were actually really popular in taverns and inns in uh, the Middle um, Ages as well, uh, because a tavern keeper would always wanna have food ready for anybody who showed up. So at the end of the day, they would put all the leftovers that they had into one big pot. And again, when you showed up um, as a weary traveler, you would have the luck of the pot, whatever leftovers were put in the pot. Um, they could be week old, day old, so you never know what you're gonna get. Always a risk. So I'm gonna cut the dough in half because I wanna have a top to the pie and a bottom to the pie. So we're gonna roll um, the bottom out first. Just make a little disc. Take your rolling pen, make sure you have a lot of flour on it so it doesn't stick. The dough should be pretty cold, so it should be pretty easy to roll. Should be, but I'm not Mrs. Rowell, so we'll see. But we're gonna put it in about a nine inch pie pan, so you want it to definitely be thin enough to fill out the, the pie pan. I'm getting a little sticky here. That's okay, just add more, more flour to your cutting board or your um, roller. All right, so it looks like this dough is giving me a little trouble. It's a little soft, um, but that's okay because we have more flour. We'll add to the dough and to the rolling pen. Keep rolling it out until we get to where we need to be. This is why I'm not the pie lady. <laughs> It'll still taste very good though, I promise. Okay, so the dough, you know, can be a little finicky. If it gets too sticky, then just add more flour. Um, you just don't want it to stick to the rolling pin or your cutting board, because that'll make it really difficult later to roll it into your pie pan. We have a, about a nine inch pie pan, so you just need it big enough to fit the bottom of the pie pan. Try to avoid any cracks. All right, so this looks pretty good. We're gonna assemble the pie now. Get your pie pan. So our pie crust is rolled out. We're gonna very gently put it in the pie pan. And it might fall apart a little, but you can piece it back together once it's in the pie pan. No one sees the bottom anyway, right? The top part's the important part. So lay this out in the pie pan. I'm gonna finish doing this and add the filling. Not the prettiest pie I've ever made, but it'll be one of the tastiest as I assure you. Okay, we have our filling already made. We're gonna dump that in to the crust. Get all the goodies, spread that out. And get all that delicious rhubarb filling in there. I'm gonna roll out the second half of the dough to make the top. We're gonna to put it in a 350 degree oven for about an hour to an hour and a half. We're gonna get this area cleaned up and when we come back, we'll make Southern buttermilk fried chicken. So we're back and we're ready to start cooking our Southern buttermilk fried chicken. Um, fried chicken is synonymous with the South and obviously in the South, you probably would have had at least three or four people bring fried chicken to a potluck. Um, the important part of the buttermilk fried chicken is the buttermilk marinade. So we're gonna start out with that. Um, we already have a butchered chicken here. Two cups of buttermilk. We're gonna add a tablespoon of Dijon, teaspoon of cayenne pepper, cause I like a little kick and a little color, teaspoon of salt, and a teaspoon of pepper. And to that mixture, we just add in the chicken. So normally I'd let this marinade for an hour in the fridge just so all of the you know spices and buttermilk get soaked in. But for today, we're just gonna go right into it. So fried chicken was always really popular at my family's potlucks. My cousins from Boston would come down every summer. 
Um, and we would always have fried chicken and baked beans. And then as the uh, grandparents got older and didn't want to cook fried chicken, we'd always have Kentucky Fried Chicken. But this is the best way to go. Um, so this will ideally, again, marinate for an hour. After that, then you can begin frying. Give my hands a quick wipe. All right, we're gonna mix the dry ingredients together in a separate bowl. This is two cups of AP flour. We have one tablespoon of garlic powder, one tablespoon of onion powder. See, building a lot of flavors here. And then we have one tablespoon of baking soda. And I mix that all together. So this is your crust. So the idea of a potluck, even though it has its roots in the Middle Ages, um, kind of came to America around the 19th and 20th century with the idea of the communal meal. And in the South, it's really, really popular for religious gatherings. Um, in the Jewish culture, it's also popular. Um, it's called a fellowship gathering. And it's also known as a Jacob's Join, a Smorgasbord, uh, dish to plate, dish to pass. It goes by many different names, but it's all the similar, similar thing. It's a potluck. Everybody brings what they want to bring and shares it with everyone. There's also a thing in um, Africa called the Safari Supper, which is kind of cool. It's a variation of a potluck. Basically, it was to bring the community together. So a neighbor would go to the next neighbor over and bring an appetizer. And then that neighbor would go bring the main course to the next neighbor. And then by the end, your whole cul-de-sac is filled with a big feast. So that's a pretty cool idea as well. All right, so we have our marinated chicken. We're just going to dredge. Actually, I should reverse these so I'll make it easier on myself. Dredge the chicken in the dry ingredients. Place it in the oil. It should take about, you might, you're gonna have to rotate it, but it should take about five, five or so minutes. Coat it really good. Some people double coat it, um, dip it back in the wet, and put it back in the dry again to get really crispy skin. a little hot. Looking good though. All right. Put three pieces in there. And make sure you have a, um, a rack to put it on when it comes out so it can strain all the oil, excess oil off. Another type of uh, potluck is actually known as a rata. And that is when um, people will gather at, they'll make one meal, people will gather at their house for one week, and then the next week you go to somebody else's house and make another meal. So that's another way you can do a potluck. All right, these are cooking fast, which is good, because I'm hungry. Just give them a flip. There is nothing more Southern than fried chicken. Especially fried chicken with buttermilk. And again, this was one of my family's favorites, and I swear, I don't know about other parts of the world, but if you go to Virginia, at least three people bring six different variations of uh, mac and cheese. Fried chicken is certainly synonymous with the South. There's nothing more Southern than fried chicken. And if you go to a potluck in Virginia, I guarantee there will be several different dishes of fried chicken and six different kinds of mac and cheese. Those really seem to be the two most popular things at a potluck in Virginia. Yet another way you can do a potluck is also called a meal train. This is actually kind of sad because it's popular at funerals. But basically, a person would take on the role as an organizer and get a sign-up sheet, and uh, you would take a meal train to a person's house that you know needed uh, help with making dinners or whatever. All right, so these are looking good, nice and crispy. You want to have a wire rack um, ready for the chicken to strain. Place those on there. So in my family, potlucks are really popular um, during holiday time, um, especially Christmas. We would always go to my uncle Douglas's, um, who lives outside of Stanton, Virginia, where Mrs. Rowell is from. Um, and he would always make the main course. He would always have the turkey and the ham. My Aunt Kim would always make rolls, because she makes amazing rolls. Um, and my mom would be the wild card. You never knew what she was going to make, because my mom's kind of a wild card. Anyway. And my Aunt Diane would always have a really, really good casserole. 
So it's always been a tradition in my family. All right, I'm gonna put these a few more in. And I really like potlucks because it's all about togetherness and sharing your own cooking story. Um, you know, if you have an Italian background, maybe you bring an Italian dish. If you have a Southern background, maybe you bring fried chicken and shrimp and grits. Um, and just get people together and get to know one another. It's a very celebratory, um, communal type of thing. All right, so I'm gonna let these finish cooking um, and put the rest of the chicken in and let that finish cooking as well. And when we come back, we'll make sweet corn pudding. Hi, welcome back. We're gonna continue on with our sweet corn pudding. Again, a, another traditionally Southern dish. Um, we always serve it at holidays, um, but it could be found in a potluck as well. And it could not be more easy. This is probably the easiest recipe I've ever uh, come across for corn pudding. Um, there are a lot of different variations of corn pudding, but this one is so easy. Literally, you put everything into a food processor and bake it. So simple and delicious. So let's see, we're gonna start with our eggs. We have four eggs. Literally just crack it and put it in the food processor. Four eggs. Then this has a lot of fat in it, which is good. And you'll find that a lot with potlucks too. People always wanna showcase their best dish, obviously, because they're sharing it with everyone. And a lot of people's best dish has a lot of fat because that's what tastes good. So um, a lot of, you don't expect to be on a diet and go to a potluck. Um, we're gonna add whole milk, half cup whole milk, heavy cream, or whipping cream. This is whipping cream, I believe. That would be even better. That's a cup of whipping cream. Uh, we have six tablespoons of sugar. Um, this might be a lot depending on what type of corn you have. If you have fresh corn and you know it's a really, really sweet corn, you might want to dial back on the sugar. Six tablespoons of sugar. I'm using thawed um, frozen corn, so it's not very sweet, but if it's corn season and you're getting a lot of really good sweet corn, then you probably don't need as much sugar. So just kind of um, use your best judgment, taste your corn um, before you take it off the cob. Um, in Virginia, corn grows everywhere. Um, in a one mile radius of my mom and dad's horse farm in Virginia, you pass 20, 20 farms that are growing corn. Uh, so that you probably wouldn't need as much sugar for. Um, also, the Incans have about 100 different types of corn, none of which taste very good or are very sweet. So if you're using Incan corn, which I doubt any of you are, um, you would definitely want to add sugar. So it just depends on what type of corn you have. Sweeter, less sugar, obviously. All right, so that was a half a stick of butter. Um, I'm gonna baking powder, salt, we'll add that in at the end actually. Two uh, tablespoons of AP flour. These are gonna bind it all together. And the corn. Let's see, dump the corn in. And it seems kind of weird to puree the corn. Um, you, you could leave this part out and just blend in all the other ingredients and leave the corn for last and just stir the corn in. But I kind of like the smooth texture when the corn's blended in. It's more souffle-like. It's a little fancier too. Um, and then add some salt. And that's it. So you could add pepper too if you're a big pepper fan. Um, some people add onion powder or onions, which is also good. Let's turn this up so it's actually blending. Blend that all together. When it kind of reaches the consistency you want, you just stop it there. Some people don't like, you don't want it to be like completely like, you know, mush and liquidy. You want it to have a little body and fiber so you can get a good spoonful. All right, we're gonna, since this is all ready, we're gonna grease our casserole dish to prepare it for um, baking. Clean out the space here a little bit for you. All right. Best way to grease is with butter. So that's what we're gonna do, because this dish wasn't fattening enough. This dish is so good. I actually, I went to a potluck wedding once. I know it seems a little odd, but they're actually pretty popular in the South. 
Um, and this is what I brought. Obviously a bigger pan than this. There are a few more people, but everybody loved it. It was so good. It's one of my favorite things to make at holidays too. My grandmother insists on having corn pudding every get together, especially Christmas and Thanksgiving. I've also been to, people, people love potlucks obviously in the South, but I've also been to a potluck uh, for one of my uh, godchildren. Um, it was actually a really cool idea, especially since now cooking's so popular and cooking with your kids is a cool thing to do. Um, they had all of the seven-year-olds get together and each seven-year-old brought a dish they cooked with their parents or cooked on their own. Some were very interesting and not editable, but others were great. So that's kind of a cool thing to do with your kids as well. See, it's still kind of chunky, um, but it'll firm up in the oven kind of liquidy, but it'll firm up because we have the egg and the flour in there. And that's kind of what you're looking for. It's about 45 minutes in a 350 degree oven, but you're really looking for the, the consistency to be firm because you want to be able to scoop it out and put it on your plate. All right, there you have it. We're going to get this into a 350 degree oven for about 45 minutes. Keep an eye on it. Um, do you just want it to be firm? and cooked all the way through. Might be less than that, might be more than that, depending on your oven. I'm gonna get this area cleaned up, and then when we come back, we're going to have all our dishes plated and we'll present our Shenandoah Valley potluck. Welcome back, we have our potluck ready to go. Looks similar to what I would experience in a Shenandoah Valley potluck. Uh, the first thing we're gonna plate is our pie. So let's cut into it. I don't know if I did Mrs. Rowell justice, but it looks pretty good. The crust is certainly flaky. Oops. Oh, so close. Almost got it out. It's flaky crust, so there you go. <laughs> we know it'll taste good. Um, but you see the rhubarb in there, and it's got that, you know, nice, gooshy center and the flaky crust. Um, so that's our first dish, popular to any potluck. Um, we have our corn pudding that just came out of the oven, nice and hot. I think my grandmother would be proud of that. It smells sweet from here. All right, and lastly, our fried chicken. Done with flour, not breadcrumbs. It's extra crispy and delicious. Actually, traditionally, when you would bread um, chicken to be fried, you would shake it in a paper bag. So you might see that in the south as well. Um, but this looks pretty good the way I did it. Nice and crispy. It's got that cayenne pepper in there, that onion powder, the garlic powder to add a lot of flavor to the crust. So that should be delicious. So at a potluck, you know, you could do something like this. You could bring corn pudding, chicken, certainly a pie. If you can buy one at Mrs. Rowell's, all the better. This one's pretty good. So these are some of the most popular dishes that you would find at a Shenandoah Valley potluck. But you can also do um, other popular dishes would be casseroles. Uh, green bean casserole is really popular in the South. And it's also a really popular Thanksgiving dish, so it's probably done elsewhere, I would assume. Um, ambrosia salad, um, also very popular. So ideally, you have a lot of people, a lot of food, and everybody goes away happy. So here you have it, folks, your Shenandoah Valley potluck. You have your Mrs. Rowell's famous rhubarb pie, you have your sweet corn pudding, and your crispy fried buttermilk chicken. I'm Sarah Nicholas. Thank you for joining me on this chapter of the story of cooking, and I look forward to seeing you next time.